Welcome to the Voice Me podcast. Information and advice on the world of voiceover presented by voiceme.co.za, the South African search directory for voice artists and related services. I'm Andrew Sutherland, founder of Voice Me, and in today's episode, I'm talking to Daniela Pellegrini van Royen about the legal and law side of the VO industry. Daniela's career in the media industry has spanned over 20 years, in both Johannesburg and London. She started in her teens as a TV presenter and performer, and later was selected from over 500 applicants to train in broadcasting at 5FM. Thereafter, she went on to work as a DJ at 947 Highfelt Stereo, a television presenter on DSTV's youth channel Go, as well as MC at high-profile events for global brands. She's also a sought-after voice artist and has been the voice of many TV channels, including DSTV, SABC1, Fox, Sony Entertainment Television, as well as Animax. She is also currently the voice of Nat Geo Wild on DSTV and works with many commercial radio stations. Her VO work has been used all over the world. And as an actress, she's featured on many TV commercials over the years. On top of all of this, she's an admitted attorney, having studied law at WITS and completed her LLB in 2016 with distinction. She works in contract, corporate, mergers and acquisitions, intellectual property, licensing agreement and has experience in tax law in South Africa. She is also a Golden Key member, which is the world's largest collegiate honor society with membership only given by invitation and applied to the top 15% of college and university sophomores, juniors and seniors, as well as top performing graduate students in all fields of study based solely on their academic achievements. Welcome to the show, Daniela Pellegrini van Royen. Hi, how are you? I'm fantastic. Good, thank Thank you for the intro. And thank you for joining us and taking time out of your lawyering and voicing and momming day to come and (laughs) chat with me today. You know, the one thing I realized with two babies under five is that the day is short. And who needs sleep? (laughs) So why not come in and do a podcast? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. Thank you for having me. It's great. Great stuff. Before we jump into all the legal stuff we uh, talk about, tell us about your journey in VO and why you decided to become a lawyer. So my performance journey started really early. I was a gymnast for 16 years and... In the early days of my gymnastics career, we all got recruited to go and do some uh, African tales at SABC, which was kind of based on shapes and forms with sort of a a shadow kind of vibe where you would perform behind a screen and make different animal shapes to tell classic African tales. From there, it progressed into doing some kind of dancing shows and some TV presenting. And I found a diary the other day which said my first voiceover, and I don't even remember this, my first voiceover experience was actually in 1996. So I've been doing this a lot longer than I thought I had been. So I was stoked to find that. I was like, yay, I've been loving it since then. So yeah, so I've worked in voiceover for many, many years, trained in radio, as you said, worked in TV, lots of emceeing work. I would guess over my career, I've probably done well over 100,000 scripts, which I was looking at the other day and I was like, sure, that's a lot of scripts. I worked out mine the other day just out of interest and I started doing, well, I started getting paid to do VO uh, in about 2009 and I've done about 50,000 since then. Amazing. And I was like, wow, I've done 50,000 voiceovers. That seems like far too many (laughs) but that's according to my records on my account system so I must have that's amazing so many I didn't think it was going to be that many I was thinking maybe like 10,000 yeah but yeah well as my mom says the time is going to pass anyway so it's amazing you know to have done so many wonderful voiceovers and voiceover is my absolute passion and I'm totally in love with it and I just think it's the most amazing portion of performance um you know i've done quite a lot of different spheres of performance and voice voice for me is the best by far i'm incredibly lucky that i do lots of promo work i've done quite a bit of character work in fact character work for you on different commercials and things like that so it's truly amazing and i I just love it and i feel like every time i'm in front of a mic doing a script it's it's just a whole different world that you get to play in it's no secret that animation is my favorite thing in the whole world of all the movies i love i can just binge watch animation non-stop and happy i think it's places. because exactly happy places happy stories and i think it's because i love the world of voice so much and you know it can just bring so many things to life mm. without any pictures you know audiobooks i grew up on as a kid as well mm. um i used to hate going to bed i still hate going to bed i'm a night owl and uh, my mom used to try and coax me to get into bed early with audiobooks and i think a lot of that is what informed my love of voice and being able to read 
scripts and make them sound natural and bring them to life. That's fantastic. So I moved abroad. I had a radio job in London after working at 947. And when I got there, shortly after that, the recession happened and the radio station closed. And I was a bit like, okay, I'm not quite ready to go back to Joburg yet. So I spent some time working in corporate and I got exposed to law. And the more I thought about law and the more I thought about contract law in particular, the more I realized artists in South Africa are truly, truly marginalized. There's so little support. Artist rights are not supported at all. And uh, I was in a recession in a miserable, gray, rainy London that hadn't seen sun for like the better part of five years. <laughs> and I thought, what am I doing here? So I packed up and moved home and I applied to law school. And I thought, you know, artist rights is really something that I'm super passionate about. You know, I think what's a challenge for artists generally, unless you're living somewhere like the States where there's SAG-AFTRA and the big unions, mm. you know, is there's very little bargaining power as an artist, the lifespan of an artist and how it moves and when you're in favor and when you're not and when you're earning money and when you're not can be quite heavily impacted by the market that you're working in and your demographic and how old you are and what your voice sounds like and who's being marketed to. So it's an interesting thing to see how artists manage to survive. And I think South Africans are resilient. So a lot of the artists in the industry keep surviving, which is brilliant. Yay, we love you. It's very important to have artists. But I just realized there's no support, you know, and they fall into this weird little niche where they're not earning enough money to really employ big law firms to defend their rights, Mm -hmm. but they're not earning little enough to form as part of the pro bono pool where people will step up and be like, no problem, I'll represent you in court. And the more I heard about cases, things like, for example, the cast of Egoli not getting any residuals at all. And when they tried to take the producers to court to say, listen, guys, you've been flighting Egoli for the better part of a decade or whatever it is, and we're not seeing one cent off of that. It made me so sad that the lawyers that brought the action to court actually brought it under the wrong type of law. They brought it as a labor law issue where actually it was a contractual law issue because performers are independent contractors even guys with a regular gig so I decided that I want to come home I want to study law I want to empower myself and I want to be able to help other artists really understand their rights and you know very often you can't do anything about it you might be going into a contract with a big company and they've dictated all of the terms but what's empowering about it is knowing what you're agreeing to up front and not getting a surprise at the end to suddenly be like oh, yeah, I agreed to that and I can't do anything about it. So that's what makes me passionate about the law and that's why I went back and studied law. So I did it in my 30s. I went on to do articles at ENS Africa, which is the biggest law firm in Africa. Although... Artist rights is my passion. I got placed in tax, which is like the polar opposite. (laughs) But having said that, I learned so much about commercial law there. And since then, I've gone on to work in commercial law, doing mergers and acquisitions, structuring and lots of commercial contract drafting. So contracts are my love. And I think because contract law and especially drafting contracts and interpreting it is actually an art in its own. It feeds very well back into my voiceovers and love of scripts. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and, and that's exactly why I wanted to chat to you about this, because knowing all of this about you from before, I wanted to chat to someone who, for one, is in the voice sphere, and two, actually knows about contracts and the legal side, and you are the perfect combination of everything, which is why I got you on the show, because Yay. you know more <laughs> than most of the voice actors that are in South Africa um, have no idea about contracts or what they should be on the lookout for. So that brings me to the first question, or the second question, I guess is are there any specific legal requirements for voiceover contracts in South Africa? And what are some of the common clauses that should be included in a VO contract? So I think what's important to know is that contract law is largely contract law. So Of course, certain areas of contract law will have particular formalities that have to be observed. For example, if you're going to buy a property, the offer has to be in writing and signed by both parties. But largely contract law is the same. So whether it's a voiceover contract or a different kind of contract, there's certain elements that are applicable to all of them. So in general, you need consensus, which is a meeting of the minds or or some type of agreement. Those things are more kind of like a declaration where you're saying to somebody, I'm going to do this and I'm doing it on my own volition. Whereas an actual agreement is generally between two or more people and those people have to agree. And that's one of the main founding principles of contract law and it's why you need to be educated going in knowing what you're agreeing to because after the fact, if it ever did go to court and you're going to fight it, The first question that's going to be asked is, were you forced to sign this contract? Was there some kind of undue influence or pressure? Mm. Or did you actively agree to this? Because if you did, it's much harder to fight your position if you've actively agreed to something saying that you've understood and you know what you're agreeing to. So meeting of the minds is the first thing. Second thing is capacity that relates to age. So obviously minors need to either work with a guardian or depending on the age of the minor, the the guardian would need to sign on their behalf. Uh, There's certain instances that an older minor can sign and then a, a guardian can ratify after. Afterwards, And it also relates to your mental state. So, of course, you know, are you intoxicated? Are you declared insane? Uh, Are you a prodigal? Do you spend way too much money and certain of your rights have been taken away? So capacity is a big one. 
to be able to enter into it. No. And if there is no capacity, it, it has different consequences on what it means, whether the contract is valid or not. Formalities. So that's very specific to the type of contract that you're going to be signing. Like I used the example earlier about land, if you're going to buy land or fixed property, those formalities are prescribed by that portion of law, which tell you you need to do these things in order for that contract to be valid. Certainty. So this is a really big one. And I think this is what relates specifically to voice artists or any performer, really everybody, but in this context, performers, is certainty. So whatever terms are in the contract, they can't be vague, they can't be ambiguous, they need to be as certain as possible. So if you are the voice artist drafting a contract, make sure your clauses and your terms are really clear. Um, Certainly in South Africa, there's a huge move towards plain English. And I think the benefit for a voice artist is we speak every day. I often read old contracts and I think to myself, who speaks like this? Nobody. (laughs) So one of my specialisms is rewriting contracts into plain English because when I read a lot of flowery language, I'm like, nobody understands this, except lawyers (laughs) and maybe judges, because a lot of the judges wrote those decisions. The original contracts at some point, maybe when they were attorneys or Or advocates at that point. When you're looking at judgments from the 1930s, I promise you they're novels. They're like Jane Austen novels. And I just think nobody talks like this anymore. So I do a lot of rewriting into plain English. And I try to make things clear, short sentences to the point If you need a whole paragraph for one sentence, you've probably got multiple ideas that you need to break up. How does that help voice artists when you get a contract that's drafted in that way and you've got this whole paragraph for one sentence, literally break it up as you would read it as a sentence and that'll help get the clarity and the meaning of what they're trying to achieve together. Okay. And then one of the last kind of general requirements is possibility. You can't enter into an impossible contract. You know, yeah. uh, it, it's just not going to work because it's impossible, literally. Yeah. <laughs> so, so those are the, the kind of the overriding legal requirements. Like I said earlier, generally contracts imply that there's two or more parties that are agreeing to the contract. A contract, if it's properly formed and there is agreement, generally creates obligations that you're both going to adhere to. And the performance of those obligations is linked to the contract, but it's a slightly different thing. From a voiceover point of view, certainly what often happens is, I know in my case, I'll often get asked to do a voiceover, I'll agree to do it. So I guess the contract is technically formed, even if all the terms aren't properly worked out yet. Mm. You know, naturally, we often ask for what rates are going to be paid and usage and what stations it's going to go out on after the fact, after you've recorded. But the performance is really me getting in a booth recording, giving it to them Mm -hmm. in WAV files or MP3 or whatever they need, and they get that side. Then whoever you're doing the voiceover for, their performance would be payment and making sure they stick to whatever terms have been agreed. So shouldn't those terms, the performance fees, usage fees, any other fees that are attached to the recording and the creation of your voice, shouldn't that all be in the contract before you record? In an ideal world, yes. I'm sure, as you know, Andrew, very often (laughs) in voiceover, things are very last minute. So from my own personal perspective, when I work with new clients that are not particularly well known, I try to sort all of those terms out before. And I would say to most performers and voice artists, get as many of those in a contract as early as possible as you can. It just clarifies the position where everybody stands. Um, For my regular clients, like when I do voice work for you, um, and because I trust you and we've worked together for so many years, very often a lot of those terms have been worked out right at the beginning and it's implied and people all know that this is how the relationship has been set and we're going to work together. If you're going to do work for somebody that's abroad, for example, I don't know, a big animation house comes to you and says, I'm going to contract your voice for this particular animation that we're creating. You know, that's also a very long period of work. It's doubtful, you could, unless you've got a small part, it's doubtful that you're going to go in and record in half an hour and leave. If you're a main character, mm. that's a lot of work. That's weeks of work. Um, those sorts of contracts, I would absolutely say, make sure everything's agreed up front. And the one thing to remember about contracts is that you can only ever enforce your rights or force somebody else to perform their obligations against the other person who's made that contract with you. So in short, yes, get as many of them sorted out prior to doing the work as you can. Common clauses to be aware of and things to look out for generally if you are looking at an actual contract document. Because I think the other thing to mention is verbal contracts and agreements are as valid as written contracts and agreements. They're just often harder to prove. So bear in mind, if you are agreeing to do something with somebody, you know, good practice is if you're not going to reduce it to writing and sign it for both of you, just send a follow up email. Hey, Andrew, this is what we discussed. Just double checking that you're happy to go ahead. Although it's not a formal contract where, you know, it's a long document with 20 pages. It is actually still a contract. And there's some kind of proof that you guys had this discussion and you're on the same page about what you're tackling and how you're going to interact with each other. And would those kind of emails, those kind of 
verbal agreements in email form, for yeah. lack of a better way of saying it, would those hold up in court if something had to be fought? Yes. I'm going to give you the lawyer answer. Depends. Okay. <laughs> Lawyers say depends for everything. So yes, it would, because generally how a litigation would work is, for example, if I needed to enforce something against you, I would probably institute some kind of action if we were going to go to court and everybody had the money to do that. I would allege what I think has gone wrong. I would find the type of law. So in this case, it would be contract law as to why you've breached or why you've done something wrong. And that email where I've sent you a summary of what we've discussed would be put forward as proof of what we've agreed. Okay. If if you disputed that on the other side as the defendant, it would be for you to prove that that's not correct. So each person alleging certain allegations would need to prove what it is that they're alleging. And I think if you had no recourse to show, oh, well, I actually replied to that email to say, Daniela, that was incorrect. We actually agreed this and this. It would be very difficult for you as a defendant to prove that you didn't agree to those terms. Mm -hmm. It's not to say it's impossible, because again, everything depends, but it certainly would help your cause as the person asserting the action or bringing the action to say, well, this is what we agreed because I sent this email confirming and I didn't get a response or he didn't reply to say, no, that's not right. correct. So would you say then that should you get an email saying, hey, we agreed to this, 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 Yes. Uh, would you then create a formal quote and send that off? Would that be enough kind of in lieu of a contract? Would that form a kind of contract, a quote itself? So a quote is actually seen as an offer. And in order for there to be a valid contract amongst a whole plethora of other things, there has to be a valid offer and a valid acceptance. And there's different legal requirements that govern when it's a valid offer and a valid acceptance. But let's just assume it's valid. Um, if I sent you a quote and you replied to say, thanks, that's great, let's go ahead. The second you've accepted that quote, there's a contract in place. And whatever terms you've outlined in that quote is what the acceptance has been based on. So that forms a, a contract and those are the terms set out in the quote. Great. Generally, in my experience, if someone doesn't like your quote or feels like you've captured something incorrectly on the quote, they'll reply to say, actually, it's four weeks usage, not eight weeks usage. And then you would amend the quote and they would accept and four weeks would be the term. Correct. So whatever the latest version is that you've accepted on the paper trail of quoting and negotiating would be the one used. Exactly. And I guess the reverse of that is also true. If I sent you a quote and you replied to say, uh, no, thanks, there's no valid contract that's formed at all because you haven't accepted my offer. Okay. And would a email accepting the quote be valid enough or would they literally have to sign the quote and date it and stamp it or whatever it needs to happen on the actual quote document itself? Again, it depends on the contract. If you're buying a piece of land and you're quoting for that, the legislation that governs buying a piece of fixed property says that it must be in writing and signed. As far as a voiceover is concerned, really what you need to prove is that there was a meeting of the minds. Signed okay. quotes would be great, but the fact that someone has replied to say, yes, that's great, thanks, let's go ahead, it would be very difficult for them to say, no, but our minds didn't meet, we didn't agree, there was no consensus about how this job was going to move forward, because you've got proof saying, yes, I agree, please start the job. So very often when there's disputes, what people will come back to and say is, was there a valid agreement in place, which is all of those six things that I ran through? If the answer is yes, you then delve deeper into which part the dispute falls into. But going back to common clauses just for a mm. second, if you yeah. do actually get a, a written contract, very ordinary things to see in that contract would be a clause around who the parties are, because remember, contracts can only be enforced between the parties or amongst the parties. Definitions and interpretation. Lawyers seem to be pretty much the only people that start with a list of definitions. <laughs> and in the beginning, when I started doing law, I was like, this is so random. It makes no sense. And the more that I do it, I realize, actually, if you're going to skim read a contract, you probably need to look at definitions, clauses three, four, and five, because those are usually the meaty ones, which go around either conditions precedent or payment or mm. what's expected of you. I would always say read the whole contract, definitely. But if you want to know the meaty bits that are very different to other contracts, that's usually where they lie. And definitions, if they're well drafted, will be clear and it'll be easy to remember what they they're referring to. Obligations will be in the contract as well. So for us, that would be voiceover performance. So you're going to deliver this script by that date. You're agreeing to that kind of fee. You're going to deliver it in this format if you're recording from home. And then the obligations for the other side would be payment and how they're going to get that payment to you hmm. and details of where they're going to use that. A lot of the time they don't include that, which can be sneaky. But if you're working with somebody reputable, they will tell you it's flighting here, it's going there, it's for that long. And you know the parameters of what you're agreeing to. Yeah. And, you know, coming back to that, it is only contracted for what is in that contract. Correct. Anything that they use it outside of that would either have to be a new contract. Correct. Or 
uh, or it's breach. Or, or it's breach. Yeah. So, guys, that if you are listening, if you send out a contract or a quote or anything, make sure you outline all of your usage terms and durations and yeah. mediums. Everything must be listed for every single thing that the client has asked. If you don't include it, it is not covered basically. Also, practically, I would go one step further than that. I would also on the invoice include this is a job done, for example, for X station for that many weeks for this rate. One performance is being charged for. It's only going to be flighting for that many weeks. And make sure your invoice corresponds to the terms of what you've agreed as well. Because when you do that, you've just got more standing to be able to say, this is what was agreed. This is what you paid for. It's like a double confirmation. Exactly. Anything used outside of that, the invoice shows what you've paid for. You haven't paid to use this on 14 other stations in 12 countries. If you would like to do that, you need to pay for it. And let's agree those terms up front. Other clauses to look out for, so confidentiality, who you can talk to about it or not, and non-variation clause. This one's really important, and when people get to it, they don't really understand it until it kind of gets broken down. What a non-variation clause says, in essence, it's usually worded something along the lines of any amendment or variation to this contract will be reduced to writing and signed by the parties. What that means practically is anything you guys have agreed outside of this written agreement does not apply unless it's in writing and signed by both of you. Now, a lot of contracts have that in, so especially if you're working with the big companies, look out for that clause, because it means anything that's not in that formal document that you're signing has no effect at all. You can't rely on it at all unless you create a new agreement. Where, for example, there's a verbal agreement or you've sent a quote, and that clause is not drafted in, a non-variation is not drafted in, Mm. it means that other stuff that's agreed outside of that quote could apply. Again, cover yourself, get it in writing, get it signed if you can. But that's the effect of a non-variation clause. If it's in a contract, and this is not only voiceovers, this is every contract, Mm -hmm. you'll find most commercial contracts uh, have got a non-variation in. And it's to basically say you can't rely on anything outside of this document if we're going to fight about it. Breach clauses basically tell you what you can do, how you can do it if somebody breaches, what you, for example, must you send a notice, how many days do they have to remedy if they've made a mess up. Dispute resolution tells you if you can go to arbitration or court, so how you've got to resolve the dispute. Very often in fair contracts, what they'll say is try and negotiate in good faith first. And from a client relationship preservation point of view, I would always say try and negotiate in good faith first. Usually if you're getting to the stage where you're sending a summons, most relationships are not recoverable after that. Yeah. <laughs> that That is kind of the last resort. <laughs> uh, warranties are an interesting thing because basically what you're telling somebody if you're signing warranties is that you're, I guess you're guaranteeing or promising certain things. So if there's a requirement that you have to be a South African citizen or you're fluent in Zulu, for example, to be able to do this job and you warrant that you are and suddenly you get to studio and you can barely speak Zulu, they can sue you for breach because Zulu is not your primary language. Right. I've only ever had one voiceover contract, maybe two, where I had warranties in them. But very often, if you're the person drafting the contract, it's quite nice to have those in because, for example, if you're signing as a voice artist, you're signing with a production company that's a small production company, you might want to add a warranty in that whoever's signing on behalf of the company is authorized to do so. Because it stops them from arguing with you to say, oh, but that person didn't have authority to sign that contract. So it's it's pointless. The, right. the contract's void or is going to be cancelled. Whereas if you've drafted the warranty in to say whoever signs this contract warrants that they have the authority to do so, even if they don't have the authority, it makes no difference. They've bound the company. So things like that. That's good to know. Indemnities are scary ones. Basically, what you're saying to someone is that if anybody sues you, I mean, it depends how the indemnity is drafted. So this is just a very broad overview. If somebody sues you or something goes wrong based on the work that I've done or something that I've been involved in, even if I had no direct contact with that end third party client, for example, I will sort out all your legal costs or I will pay for the damages or I will reimburse you for whatever kind of harm has been caused to you. And often for a voiceover, it's a really disproportionate thing because, you know, imagine you're working with one of the media giants. If I'm warranting that any kind of action that's taken against you, Mr. Media Giant, based on the voiceover work that I've done, you will literally, you know, make me go insolvent because I will never have enough money to pay Mr. Media Giant to sort him out for all of his legal costs when a third party is suing that person. So indemnities are pretty scary. The problem with them is you often don't have any negotiating power over them at all as a voice artist, just because they're like, well, it's our standard contract, sign it or not. The truth is, if somebody gives you, I mean, practically, if somebody gives you a script, you read it, the client is happy, Mr. Media Giant's happy, they've accepted the voiceover, 
you've read the script exactly as they've given it to you. I just don't see how you doing exactly what's been asked would cause a damage for them that they could link back to you. So it's unlikely to to happen. It's unlikely, but just know what you're getting into when you're reading it. Um, I had one indemnity that was very similar to the example that I've just described. And I replied to the client just to say, it's so disproportionate to the amount of work that I do for you a year. You know, if I do one script for you a year to indemnify you against all claims and losses... Is hugely disproportionate. Now, there's a question of whether a court would actually uphold that because it's so disproportionate. But the point is you would have to spend money to get to court in the first place. So my reply was just to say, can we cap it, for example, that I will reimburse you to the equivalent of a year's worth of fees that you've paid me? Because in that way, you've still got some coverage and assurance that I'm not going to do anything that will cause damage to you. But I'm also only going to be liable for a year's worth of fees. So if you send me a thousand scripts, you're going to get a thousand scripts worth of fees back if something goes wrong. If you send me no scripts, if something goes wrong, monetarily, I won't have to pay you anything. And would those kind of indemnity clauses, would you be able to strike them from the contract before signing? You would, in theory. The chances of a, especially a big company allowing you to just take them out altogether is almost none. That That is more of a practical question than a legal question. But you could always ask, I guess. Absolutely. And there's no harm in asking. They'll either come back and say, yes, we're open to a suggestion, suggest what you think is fair, or they'll come back and say, not at all, sign it and take it or leave it. And that's why I was saying earlier, you know, artists have very little negotiating power because you need to earn, you need to eat. Yeah. So often if these contracts come to you, especially big juicy ones, you know, you're stuck in a position, you either take it or you leave it. But there's no harm in asking the question. Of course. (laughs) Um, And then finally is the IP clauses, which I know you want to talk about a little bit further on, how to protect your intellectual property. And I guess if someone's giving you the contract, read those properly, because very often they strip you of a lot of your IP rights as a voice artist. So let's get into that then. So how can a voice artist protect their intellectual property rights in South Africa or globally, I guess. The tricky part of law globally is that each state has got its own laws. And when it comes to IP, so for example, trademarks are registered, patents are registered. And if you had a trademark or a patent and you wanted to register it globally, you can't do a global registration. You would have to go to every single individual country where you want the protection and you'll have to register it in every country because each state works separately. And although most countries have signed quite a lot of treaties that govern IP law, they all still work independently from each other. So there'll be lots of crossover terms that you know you're protected, but you still have to do the registration in the beginning to get that protection. A lot of those treaties and things are saved on the WIPO website, World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, and you can pretty much find whatever treaty you wanted to, whether it was the Berne Convention or one of those. And sometimes there's also bilateral treaties that, for example, America and South Africa will sign, and they're quite a good repository to store those treaties. What you'll find is when you start looking at the treaties, so many of the provisions are the same everywhere. So specifically to South Africa, as a performance and when it comes to copyright, you don't actually register your copyright anywhere. Copyright protection is automatic. What the requirements are to get copyright protection is it has to be an original work. It must be in material form. So for a voice artist, that means an actual recording. Your voice has to be used somewhere. And you have to be a qualified person, which as far as the South African law goes, means you need to be a citizen or you need to be a company that's incorporated in South Africa. I remember at law school, we had a discussion over publicity, meaning that it's a lot easier to prove that the work was yours if it has been published somewhere, but it's not an actual formal requirement that it has to be published or out in the open. All it has to do is be original, reduced to material form, and you have to be a qualifying person, so a South African citizen or an entity. And even that's interesting because I saw when I was doing some extra research on this question, I saw that on one of the big IP law firm websites. But again, going back to law school, it wasn't really one of the requirements that we discussed it was more around originality and material form that you have to actually record your voice or use it in some way. And those kinds of requirements are global. So whatever country you're in, it must be original and it must be in a material form. So for voiceovers, what does that mean? It means when you're performing a script or making an expression of a script, you're automatically protected by copyright law. So in terms of how do you protect your IP rights, you just have to perform it. Okay. If somebody infringes those rights and, for example, clones your voice or recuts one of your or a few of your scripts into a new ad and puts it out somewhere without your consent, the protection at that point is much more about enforcing your IP rights. And how do you do that? Very often, I mean, it's a multiple of ways which we can chat about, but very often it'll end up that you're sending them notices to say you have unduly used my work, you have infringed my IP rights. If you don't cease and desist, I'm going to take this further and go to court or go to a tribunal or something like that. 
So it's kind of two parts to how to enforce IP. And just as a matter of interest, your copyright protection is for 50 years from the date of your death, the end of the year of your death, which is why, for example, when you, I think, Winnie the Pooh last year or this year, the copyright was lifted. I think it was last year, yeah. Yeah. Dr. Seuss is still under copyright. Roald Dahl is still under copyright. And generally for artists, it's 50 years from the end of the year that that artist died. So copyright protection is quite a long time before people can use it. So it goes into the public domain, which is why anybody can record Shakespeare and do whatever they like with it because it's Mm. in the public domain, meaning you don't have to pay anybody a royalty or negotiate to use that content. Sometimes what happens in other jurisdictions is, and I'm not too clued up on this, but I've seen it once or twice before, where certain rights on a piece of artwork go into like a family trust. But as far as I'm aware, as soon as something becomes public domain, it's a free for all. You can use that content, you can use those characters, you can... I think an example of that might be the Tolkien Trust. So the rights and all of the trademarks and all of the works that he's done is still protected by the Tolkien Trust. Yes. And that's why even 50 years down the line, you still have to get permission permission to use any of those kind of things. Yeah. But as far as I know, quite a lot of family trusts try to retain those rights. And sometimes what happens is you don't actually have to pay for them, but you still need permission because they want to know where those rights are going Mm. so that they can manage the brand. Right. Because like a Dr. Seuss, for example, is an established brand. But if it's properly squarely in the the public domain, there's nothing that they can do about it. So something for artists to know is that copyright ownership generally vests in the author, the author being the performer. But now I think what's important, and this is where law always gets a little bit blurry, you are sent a script and you voice it. You're the performer. You own the performance. You Mm. don't own the script. You don't own the product. You don't own the finished end advert or podcast or e-learning module. You only own the voice, which is why in South Africa, when we charge usage, you're allowing people to rent your voice Mm. on that particular script. It's also why when you record 10 scripts for the same client, you often charge 10 usages because, I mean, unless you're a nice guy and you give them a discount, but you know what Mm. I mean? You often charge 10 usages because your version and performance and expression of that script gets rented. I know in different jurisdictions, often it's about a buyout. So they'll buy you out on that script with your voice for that one reading only or that one final product. But generally, as the performer, you get ownership to your voice on that particular script. And that creates a whole bunch of complexity because very often what will happen, certainly in my experience, I will get contracted by a station or someone, a production company to do a voiceover. The production company and I will have the understanding that they're paying me usage. But the production company has promised to the end client that they get the full buyout of the audio as it gets delivered to them. Mm. That client then goes and uses that audio online, social media, radio, TV. Three years later, they dig it out again. I currently have a number of ads that are being used on different radio stations. And they dig out that ad again and they start flighting it again, not realizing or maybe realizing and just being a little bit sketchy that they're supposed to actually come to the voice artist and say, I need to reuse this. What's your usage, the current rate of the usage so that I can flight this advert again? Mm. And I don't know if it's a miseducation to clients or like I say, maybe some clients are being sketchy. You never know. I, I would like to think the positive that they're not being sketchy and they just don't know. But it's also quite hard for voice artists to track. Well, I use that production company. They know the end client, but how do I get to the end client now to say, in fact, sometimes you don't even know who the end client is. You might know the brand that you voiced, but maybe there's an ad agency in between. So how do you get to the final person to say, you're now using this voice over without my permission and actually you're infringing my copyright? Hmm. Because while you think you're entitled to the final recorded product, you are, you still have to rent the voice, the music, the backing track that you've used. And a lot of clients don't know that, especially in South Africa. I think it is mostly miseducation from the client side. They might just not understand that that's how it works because that may never have been explained to them how those things work in the industry. I think if it was an ad agency or a production company, they should know how things work. And And they should educate the end client. And they should be educating their end client as well. But quite often those questions don't come up and the client just is uninformed. And probably the best way to protect yourself as, as an artist in that case is to, when you're doing a job, any kind of job, is to get as much information about the client, the production house, the agency, Absolutely. the end client up front as well, just so that you have it on record. So if something does happen down the line, you at least know you can contact these companies to get answers or at least yeah. follow the trail of answers to get to someone that might know what's going on. 
Absolutely. And if you have a good relationship with the production company or the radio station or whoever's creating the spot or the product, the mm. end product, it's very often best to go to them as your first point of contact because they may have a sensitive relationship with the end client and actually things are channeled better through them. Of course, you'd go to whoever booked you first and Absolutely. then you know, say, this is the thing. And then they would go to the next person and hopefully you get the daisy chain of answers coming back to you promptly. But yeah, but I'm I going mean, to caveat that by saying, just know that you will have to follow up and follow up and follow up. Of course. <laughs> People of are busy. <laughs> so that's the bit I wanted to say about ownership. And then just remember in South Africa, there's a copyright amendment bill that's still churning around. Yeah. Um, but performers are also, in theory, protected by the Performers Protection Act. Both the Copyright Act as it stands at the moment and the Performers Protection Act vest the right in the artist or in the, the performer to authorize a third party or not any other party other than yourself to reproduce your voice to allow them to use it in a different kind of context, to mm. publish it, to broadcast it. Those rights lie with you. That's the point of copyright is you've created something. You're the author. You've got full ownership and you are the one who's be able to say to somebody else, yes, you can use this. You can recut it. You can whatever you need to do with it, broadcast it, put it on a social media platform. And generally it's by your consent. What you need to know about this is when it comes to actual contracts reduced to paper, very often what happens is a lot of contracts will take those rights away from you. It will say your copyright in your voiceover work vests in me as the production company and I have the right to reproduce or to replicate or distribute your work as I see fit. So those are things to look out for. Yeah. And hopefully if you can get that struck out of contracts because that's definitely going to hamstring you down the line Absolutely. if you're looking for renewal usages and whatnot because you've essentially signed that away. Absolutely. And also something to just be aware of on that note is double check if it's a contract for a specific voiceover or let's say you get an animation film and it's linked to your character. You may still be OK to accept the fact that you're giving up those IP rights. But remember, it's for that one voiceover only or for that character. Often what sneaky people do is they will send you a blanket contract with a blanket IP clause that says all voiceover work that you do, the copyright vests in them, which means even if you perform for someone else, automatically the copyright is going to vest in that third party because that's what you've agreed. Again, those things can be contested and you can do your best to push back on them, but look for things like that and rather try and get them removed or don't work with that person because anybody who's yeah. trying to remove you of all your copyright, probably not someone that you want to work with. They're a bit sketchy and they are very likely to use your stuff for all sorts of other things. I want to move on to AI sure. a little bit because these are questions that come up a lot in the Facebook groups and the voiceover forums. Are there any specific words or clauses that artists should look out for in contracts to protect themselves when it comes to AI-generated voices or AI-generated clones of themselves or their work being used for AI purposes? Yes. So again, providing you're getting an actual written contract or an email brief, you can look out for things like voice duplicate, voice ID, voice replicate, machine learning, synthesize, reproduction, clone, manipulation, simulate. If you see any of those kinds of words and they're not in express clause to say, please note, we will be using your voice to clone it, to synthesize it. You know, if they're more sneakily stuck into other clauses and please, guys, I know you read for a living as a voice artist. Most people don't read when it comes to contracts. Read Read, read, read. And even if it takes you twice as long as you thought, read because you never know what's sneaky and stuck in. So look out for those types of keywords to see if you can spot anything. Obviously, if there's a very obvious clause that says we will use your voice for AI. I mean, that's pretty obvious, self-explanatory. If you find any of these other keywords snuck somewhere into the contract, there's nothing wrong with asking outright if it's going to be used for any kind of AI or cloning. Um, and you can also ask them to expressly put into the contract that they will not use your voice for AI to either train or create AI algorithms. And if they say that they are going to use it, or even if they say they're not, you can ask for an additional clause to be added in just to say, if you ever use it, you have to compensate me and you have to let me know that it's being used, where it's being used, who it's been sold to. And that clause needs to be really clear and transparent. And I think the basis with all contract law is whether you read a clause and don't understand it or whether questions come to mind that you're not sure about and they haven't really been embodied in this actual written agreement, ask. There's no harm in asking. You know, a lot of the smaller companies probably won't be able to have the answer for you and they won't go spend the money on legal resource to come back and say, 
okay, these are the answers, some might, but if it's a big company, just know that you may have to wait a little bit because it'll need to go past legal. But if it's yeah. a big company like a media giant, you can ask those questions, just phrase them tactfully and 99 out of 100 times people are happy to come back and answer. There's an issue of conflict of interest as well, because if you have assigned your rights away and the client does use your voice to train a AI clone of your voice and they end up creating an ad or piece of content that's in conflict with something that you have done yourself, you know, when they create something that without your knowledge, you might have a contract with, say, client A for a certain banking brand or whatever, let's say, for example, but client B, which you did a completely different job for, clones your voice and ends up using it for a different banking ad. And now client A says, well, we can't use you anymore because you're doing a client B bank. Mm. Uh, and you're like, no, I didn't. So the AI thing is of concern where it can create problems for you that are outside of your initial work. It's just something that I've always kept in the back of my mind because cloning is becoming very easy these days. Yeah, uh, There's apps out there that can clone your voice with less than a minute of recorded audio. Unreal. Whereas... Before, it used to take, you know, 10 or 20 hours of recorded voice to clone someone. So it is something to look out for, guys, when you are looking in those contracts. Look out for those words. Absolutely. And ask questions. It's going to save you a lot of hassles later if you deal with it up front. And just something to know, and it won't be an option for everybody, but there is a South African lawyer called Dario Milo who is super hot on copyright law and cyberspace. And he's honestly just brilliant, really, really brilliant. He works for Weber Wenzel. I know not everybody will be able to afford him, but if you really, truly find yourself in a pickle where one of the huge banks is suing you because there is a conflict of interest, for example, in all of my time, my 25 odd years in the industry, I don't know one voice artist that ever got sued for a conflict of interest. Um, Normally, they just get a threatening letter and then... I don't know, make a plan to get it taken off air or something. I don't know. I don't even know what happens. But yeah, Dario Milo is a really great guy and he is so clued up on how all of these things work. So just a name to keep in the back of your mind, should you ever need it. My wish for you is that you never need it. (laughs) Of course. What do you do if a client does breach your voiceover contract? What recourse do you have? (sighs) It's always such a tough question. So there's a practical answer and there is a legal answer. Legally, what you would normally do is send a notice of demand to tell that client that they are in breach, that they have a certain number of days to remedy the breach. So, for example, if they did clone your voice and use it without your authorization, you would send a letter saying, dear client, please note that I have been informed. This ad has been cut. I did not voice it. I believe you are the person who's put it together. You're in breach of our contract because my voice was never authorized to be used for that particular advert or on that station or whatever it is, that piece of work. Please, within the next 10 days, make sure that it's pulled off all platforms and that all the work is deleted. If not, we will be instituting action against you, which means taking you to court. If they do nothing about it and they go past that time frame that you've given them, your next remedy really is to either get an interdict to stop them from playing that advert. But again, you have to apply to court for that. There are ways that you could get an urgent interdict, but you would have to prove why it's urgent. And those are often very difficult to get. Mm. The other thing to do would just to sue them ordinarily for breach of contract. But again, people need money. The good thing to note, although it is a bit of a hassle from an admin point of view, is if your voiceover is, for example, only worth 2000 Rand, you can go to the small claims court because I, I must double check the cap, but I think it's about 15,000 now. Anything 15,000 or lower, you can go to small claims court, you go without a lawyer, you sit in front of a commissioner, you bring the evidence that you need to, and a commissioner will decide if that person is breached or not. A lot of people don't like to go to small claims court. Basically, most of the MAG courts, if not all of them, have got a small claims court in the magistrate's court. So if you're sitting in Joburg, you can go to Randburg, for example. But a lot of people don't like to do that just because you physically have to turn up. It mostly runs after or at least runs until after working hours so often your slot might only be at six o'clock at night you know if you've got small kids or things like that it's not always practical to get there Mm. but the alternative is instituting a claim in magistrates court or in high court depending on the amount of money that you're suing for and that can be quite costly and could take months if not years so the last i heard and i don't litigate at all the last i heard especially during covid is that you were waiting about two years for a court date for your first hearing between one and two years. It's a long time. Yeah. And again, that's why when somebody says, please do this voiceover for me and you've discussed everything verbally, especially if you don't know the person and have a relationship with them, send a follow-up email because I promise in two years you're not going to remember exactly what was discussed. (laughs) You know, at least you can refer back to that email and say, oh, yes, of course. 
You know, that's that's what we had agreed on. Great advice. Daniela, thank you so much for coming in today. I think that covers pretty much everything that I wanted to talk about, at least. I had some other questions, but you've actually answered them earlier. <laughs> uh, is there anything else we should be looking out for legal-wise as artists? I guess practical things from my experience over the years, especially with new clients. Um, I have often made the mistake in my career of not asking for a deposit up front, and then very often people don't pay you. Mm -hmm. And although, again, you'll have some kind of legal recourse that you can sue them for non-payment, often it's difficult. A great option, which a lot of people that I know have used, is blacklisting, especially if they're companies, blacklisting them with the credit bureaus to say that they're a non-payer. But please be aware that if they pay you, you have to remove that blacklisting as quickly as you can. You can't leave it on indefinitely. It will always show up that they were a non-payer and that they were in default, but you do need to have it removed, at least from the time that they pay you taken off their record. So that's always quite a good recourse. But practically, just be sensible. You know, Talk to people if they're good clients, explain the problem, let them know what you're thinking, do it tactfully. Normally, 98% of the time you come to a really good outcome. If you are stuck and you don't know your legal rights, there are so many lawyers out there that can help you. Places like the SAG-AFTRA website are very good for practical advice. Just remember, American law is different to South African law, so not everything will be applicable, but it can give you some good tips and insights into what to look out for and what to be aware of. And just stay safe. And remember, ask. There is no harm in asking if you're not sure about whatever you're agreeing to. And although it can be difficult to negotiate, you do still have some power to push back and say, actually, that's not something I'm willing to accept. Because at the end of the day, this is your livelihood. This is your job. This is your passion. And you need to make it sustainable. So I just wish you guys all the best of luck. May you have a fruitful, long, 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 happy career. Great stuff. And then while we are talking about sag there is the South African Guild of Actors, which does help artists with legal advice and you guys can join them you become part of a powerful unified voice that aims to right current wrongs and influence future legislation to create fair and equitable working conditions this is from their website they are apolitical non-racial and democratic and represent your interests saga gives you a legal voice so join and use it it's accessible to all actors and voice actors in south africa and is committed to building a broad base of membership among aspiring actors, professional actors, and committed semi-professional actors. It's a yearly membership fee, and you are covered from any legal stuff that you need. They will offer advice and help you out in court and legal proceedings. I would strongly encourage everyone to join Saga if you have not. And if you need more information, you can go to the website. I'll put that link in the show notes. Cool. Thanks very much. Thanks a bunch. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you've learned something. I know Daniela certainly gave me a lot to think about. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and my support team at support at voiceme.co.za. Leave a comment here or give me a call on 0861 Voice Me. That's 0861 864 2363 if you're in South Africa. And to sign up for a Voice Me profile, register from the homepage at voiceme.co.za. I strongly believe a constructive social environment for our users, whether they be artists, clients, producers, or talent agents, is highly beneficial for our industry. Like, follow, and engage with VoiceMe and each other on at VoiceMeSA on all social networks. If you liked this episode, please like, share, subscribe, turn on automatic downloads, or click the bell icon to get notified so you don't miss our next one. I'm Andrew Sutherland, and that's it from me here at VoiceMe for this week. Cheers for now. Cheers for now.